Let's do a little preparation meditation. <clears throat> relax your body, relax your mind. Whatever fears, whatever worries. Recall that they're actually, from the viewpoint of the Buddha's mind realizing reality, they're empty of the attributes that we're projecting upon them. Place your attention on the breathing. Just as the great worries of our youth, when looked upon years later, seem very unworrisome. Right now, even the things that, we're, that we may be so concerned about, desires, doubts, fears, anger, depression, whatever, The causes of them, the objective causes, when we think about them later, at another time, they'll seem much different. They won't cause that same reaction. So thinking like that, extricate yourself from other discursive thoughts and just focus on the breathing a little bit longer.
And when sufficiently calmed, bring your attention further inward as though withdrawing from outside, away from the sense organs to your heart. Place your attention now on the nature of the mind that you begin to recognize as clear light, unobstructing, unobstructed. Let go of the objects of thought. Try to place your attention on observing the subject mind. Use alertness, the mental factor like the mental spy, to watch whether you have lost that object. With mindfulness, try to bring it back, hold it. and recognizing that we're on a long journey to enlightenment. It's our desired destination for the welfare of all. Many people that whose fate depends upon our achievement of enlightenment are waiting long it takes, I will work to eliminate my afflicted states and their seeds, the imprints, develop the, all of the good qualities, virtuous mental states, the bodhisattvas, perfections. In so doing, I'll overcome my own suffering, find peace of mind, but also in being less needy, less harmful, I'll not only be able to avoid hurting others, I'll actually have the space and time to help them, and the qualities, the knowledge, to be able to help them meaningfully with merit collected for their benefit, I'll have resources. With good mind, with patience, I'll be attractive both mentally and physically, be able to exercise some charisma to influence them in the Dharma. So to be able to fulfill these goals, to achieve enlightenment for the welfare of sentient beings, I have to be able to understand the mind to overcome the negative states of mind, especially 
the ignorance that grasps to a truly existent self of phenomena in general. Also the, the very intimate wrong view of the transitory collection that grasps to the conventionally existent I as truly existent. Those, the wisdom states that act as antidotes to those kinds of deluded states, afflicted states, are hard to generate at first. So I'm going to learn about the various six root and twenty secondary afflictions in order to overcome them. So for that purpose, to, I'm going to listen to the, the class tonight, participate for the welfare of all sentient beings in order to achieve this goal of enlightenment, accumulating merit to develop the two bodhicittas. back, present. So, oh. so there's plenty of space. You guys could move closer if you wanted to. You could sit on one of these, at one of these tables. I was just saying, on one of these tables. You could sit at one of these tables. You could even sit on one of these tables, you know. Anyone have any questions? Mark, what are the six root afflictions? So if you don't have questions, I have. <laughs> Migraine. <laughs> yes, this one. Yeah. Kerry, do you know the six root afflictions? No, it's the anger. <clears throat> um, ignorance. Okay, we're jumping around again. Yeah. Is there some consistent, some consistent? Okay. Pattern not pattern forced to do that. Say, what say? Anger. Anger and ignorance. Ignorance. Yeah. Those are definitely afflictions, yeah. Chris, I can always call it Chris. Chris will know. He started out with anger and ignorance. Chris, what can you can you add the other four? Six sure. Okay. Good. Okay. I thought so. So, uh, let's see. Attraction. Attraction. Is there another name for that? I'm not quite sure that one. Attachment. Attachment. Okay. So we've got <coughs> essentially the three root delusions, right? Attachment, anger, and ignorance. Then. Pride. Pride. Deluded doubt and, wrong view. and afflicted view. So wrong uh, of those afflicted views, one of them is called wrong view. So it's called afflicted view. Good. Okay. So last time we began to talk about these. I think even the time before, and uh, mentioned a little bit of the different ideas of Nargajuna and Chandrakirti about what was the root of cyclic existence. Frank, what do you think? What's the root of cyclic existence? The root of cyclic existence? Yeah. Klesha. Klesha. Okay, but Chandrakirti and Nargajuna differed on identifying which particular klesha was the root. So is attachment the root? Sometimes in the Theravada you see desire is the root of samsara. You think ignorance, okay. Sister Oma, what do you think? Ignorance the root of some sort? Uh, it, it, it's a wrong view. Um, wrong view is the, is uh, the root of some sort. That's one of the, of, the, of the five afflicted views, wrong view. Oh, okay. Um, it, um, not wrong, um, <coughs> the 
doctors think of you, but you're thinking of well, the, the ignorance. It's not the ignorance. It's the um, it's the one like it, that. It, it, it's the um, when that's right. Totally not being able to see the right way to do things, and so that's afflicted you. But still, I think that that's the root. It's, it's, they, I don't know that one. Okay. Well, okay, we'll, we'll accept that. We'll put, say, we'll, 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 the view of the transitory collection. Okay, the there view we go. Of the aggregates is changeable. There's some grasping of person. <clears throat> mine or somebody else's thinking there is a real entity. Is this is mine or someone else's? Does it say that here? No, I just had it on the tape. On the okay, video. no, it's, it wouldn't be my own or someone else's, but anyway, it would be my own, grasping to my own self, the view of the transitory view of the transitory collection. So I'd say, yeah, it could be. So Frank's kind of vying with Nargajuna. I can kind of see him somehow as Nargajuna. Sister Om is kind of settling with Chandrakirti, who's the great... They're not really different. Not really different. Do you, what do you think, Don? Do you have a feeling? <coughs> Did you think about this? Um, yeah. Did you debate I, in the I car think with... I can, yeah? I can, uh, unequivocally. I can, I, no, I can't <laughs> unequivocally. <laughs> but, but ignorance being the... I can see uh, the view of the transitory collection coming out of ignorance, and ignorance is the first of the 12 links. So mm -hmm. I tend to, my mind tends to go there. Could you see no. maybe the uh, ignorance coming out of the view of the transitory collection? You said the transitory, view of the transitory collection? Okay. Ignorance more is the root. <coughs> Excuse me, Lisa, what do you think? I think From a psychologist's point of view. Oh my goodness, no. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think pretty basically it's a true? self, it's a grasping of the self. The root of samsara? The hmm? root of samsara? This is my question, what's the root yeah, of samsara? I think it's a, a constant grasping of the self as being inherently existing. Okay, so that's the view of the transitory collection. So starting from Carey's idea that it's, or, or who is it that said, uh, Frank said, the klesha, so the afflictions. In a sense, the afflictions are the root, but if you look at amongst them, there's something amongst the afflictions that acts as the root of all the other afflictions. Okay, now you're changing your mind. Okay. Okay, but you just you just said that the root of samsara. So you're you're making a difference. The root of afflictions is different than the root of samsara. I would think the root of the afflictions would be the root of samsara, as you said. The root of the of samsara was the view of the transitory collection. Anyway, something to think about. Okay. <laughs> okay. Because I found it here it's in the tape. Because that was just the part where I had to stop. It says the root of all of them is ignorance. But it's more than that, because it's a wisdom that is looking the wrong way, perceiving things in the wrong way. Fundamentally, it is an active, misapprehending wisdom. Which is? Ignorance. Ignorance. The, the ignorance that we'll be talking about later, yeah. Good. Okay, so we talked a little bit about attachment. Um, I, I gave you uh, one particular view of attachment and anger, uh, which are these first two ones. Attachment basically... Uh, takes an object, a, uh, an afflicted object, an afflicted object, in other words, an object that's arisen because of karma and delusion, and perceives it as attractive because of one's karma, if, one in, you know, if one uh, experiences some pleasure in observing that. And because of that, uh, because of the habit energy of attachment, not everyone who perceives something as attractive would generate attachment for it, but when the mind, uh, lacking proper attention, inappropriately attends to that, what we call inappropriate attention, thinking, wow, that's good, that would be really nice. If I, if I had that friend, I'd always be happy. If I had that, I'd have it. You know, I, if I had my stash, you know, everything would be okay. So exaggerating the qualities of something in various ways with wrong, with wrong uh, attention and then wanting to have that or wanting to get it if you don't have it or wanting to keep it if you already have it. Those are the main qualities of attachment. 
So in the, we, we mentioned last time in the Abhidharma Kosha, it's, it's just said, what is attachment? It is clinging of the three realms, chakpa. So the word attachment in Tibetan is dochak, and here it's just says chakpa. So we, you say dupa is the same one for desire, desirous or longing, longing uh, attachment, you might say, long, longing clinging. It is clinging of the three realms. It is the function of producing suffering. So that's important to recognize that attachment is actually an, an enemy, although it seems to be our friend. In fact, we often cultivate it and we're upset when others don't have attachment for us. If your friends don't have attachment for you, I forgot your name in the back on the D. D. If, if, you're, if, if your kids or your friends or people f that you've cultivated as, as companions didn't have attachment for you, would you be happy? Or would you feel a little like, gosh. Oh, you feel really, okay, good. Okay, so you've, You've already experienced the, the suffering of others' attachment and need, huh? Yeah. Okay, so we talked a bit about attachment before. What are the antidotes to attachment? Does anyone know? Diana, do you know the antidotes to attachment? The temporal antidotes. Of course, ultimately meditating on emptiness. So if you're... If you have attachment to a uh, chocolate sundae, uh, what's the best ice cream in Santa Cruz right now? Before the gelateria starts, before the... Marianne's. Marianne's, I heard it's there. So Marianne's, uh, Dorji agrees, okay. So big Marianne's uh, sundae. So if you meditate on death and impermanence, that will overcome attachment. It, it could. No, it might, might. It, 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 the nature of suffering that it's not ultimately going to bring me any happiness Sunday. Ultimately in the nature of suffering. So ultimately, you don't necessarily mean ultimate truth, no. you just mean finally. Yeah, but, oh, we do use the word ultimately, but just so we don't, so we don't have to use, we don't have to invoke an understanding of ultimate truth, but it's nature is suffering. Yeah? Uh, I might have mentioned on other occasions that Tisha, uh, when he came to Tibet, brought some oral tradition how to deal with anger. And you could think of similar kind of things for attachment. Like uh, I'll mention when we get to anger, his presentation of how to overcome that. But basically attachment is superimposing on something qualities that it does not have. And we could take the four wrong conceptions that phenomena are, the phenomena that are actually impermanent, misconceiving them and thinking them as permanent things that are actually the nature of suffering, thinking of them as pleasurable, things that are actually un, uh, repulsive and unattractive, conceiving them as attractive, and things that have no self. This would be like the wisdom, the, 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 over, the antidote meaning ultimate truth, seeing that they are selfless or empty of true existence. When I say, the, the, have you heard those before, the, those wrong conceptions? So they're a little bit like the, um, the, the, the uh, misconceptions about the First Noble Truth. You know, the, the, there are four aspects of the First Noble Truth that the bodhisattvas have to, or the, even the hearers, solitary realizers have to recognize. Do you, have you heard that before? Do you, what, do you know what those are? You're nodding. The four aspects of suffering, in other words. Um, suffering, impermanence, empty, and selfless. Yeah. So... Here we, we said uh, and the antidotes being uh, usually comes uh, perma you know permanence first grasping at permanence so impermanence suffering and I said repulsive or unattractive and uh, selfless so how does that have to do with because in the in the first aspect of the four noble truths it's empty and selfless do you remember that Georgie? Studying the four noble yeah. What is your name? <laughs> it is. You remember something? Yeah. You said your name was George before. How does? Do you have any idea how that works? Because um, the one about uh, 
uh, uh, how to say empty is not in the lower schools is not talking about emptiness because selfless is talking about emptiness this empty is talking about uh, empty of being a partless you know so some having some kind of uh, you know, when we talk about a, a, a person who is permanent, partless, and independent, or it, when we see something that might be attractive, it just it just seems like it's just one one thing. So to analyze its parts and to see that there are parts that are in uh, not congruent with that, that are discordant with that idea of attractiveness, you know, with the scalpel of the mind opening up the body and seeing the lymph and the the uh, the feces and the blood and the bones and uh, recognizing that and then recognizing that what your mind had just thought of as something which was attractive actually is uh, the opposite of that when you actually analyze it. E even the skin, even if you if you look at it from the outside as, as Shantideva does in the Bodhisattva Charyavatara, he said if you're, if you're so uh, uh, intent upon lying with your sweetheart, laying with your sweetheart, or lying with you, sweetheart? Lying. lying, okay, thank you. This lying to your sweetheart, but lying with your sweetheart, okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> um, if you're so intent on that, why not uh, just put, you know, get uh, their skin and put it as your pillowcase? You know, obviously that's not the same. You know, the, 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 the mind is saying, oh, it's not just the, not the other things, it's the skin, you know, it's that which I find so attractive. So there are many different parts that we might think we find attractive, but if you, if you analyze, you find even those parts that we think are attractive are not, uh, are not attractive the way that our mind thinks. No, because it's, uh, that would be what's called appropriate attention. Because indeed, uh, phenomena are not. Is it, because the the th this is not a wrong view. This is attachment. This klesha. This uh, this uh, this delusion. This klesha is exaggerating the quality of something. But isn't, isn't um, exaggerating the quality of something to say that you know, those things are repulsive? Uh, not. Uh, to ordinary mind, this acts as an antidote to the mind which is exaggerating. So although they're not inherently repulsive, they are uh, not what our mind thinks of in an exaggerated sense. So it's, it, it is not meant that uh, a Buddhist is supposed to, if one doesn't have a problem with attachment, that you're supposed to go around and you look at someone and say, Get away from me, you know. It's not that you're supposed to develop repulsive like repulsiveness toward beings like that, but as an antidote uh, to recognize that they are, they do have a, f a factor that you are oblivious of, of being repulsive. Like to think that the person that looks so young and attractive now will eventually get old. Sometimes we see someone old, maybe, see, maybe you've seen some old fellow or lady at the beach, uh, partially unclothed, and you and you thought, oh, <laughs> but that we will we will be that way if we're not that way already. We will be that way for sure. In the in the attractive beings that we see now, will be that way. So to imagine the person transforming and becoming unattractive and so forth, that acts as a uh, cold water to that that hot mind of attachment. Is it not to kind of balance out the mind that's disturbed in one way or the other? To meditate on impulsiveness. Is yeah. that how I see it? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Kind of medicine. So here it says, just as uh, has been said above, it's a men attachment is a mental factor that perceives a contaminated thing to be attractive by way of its own entity. I think what it means here is sort of like it's, that's just its nature, in the same way that Diana was using the word uh, ultimately before. Ultimately, things are, uh, s 
are, uh, how did you use it in, in the phrase, ultimately things are uh, suffering, the nature of suffering here. So this is thinking that things that are finally, and their real, their real entity, their real nature is that they're attractive. It doesn't, attachment does not hold things to be existent by their own entity in the sense of emptiness. You know, the, the, the ignorance that grasps of, at things as being existent from their own entity. It means something different here. And having perceived contaminated things naturally attractive, thereupon it seeks the contaminated thing. It seeks to get it or seeks to keep it if it already has it. With regard to this, the foremost omniscient excuse me, foremost omniscient one, Tsongkhapa, uh, is said in the Lamrim Chemo, attachment observes an external or internal object that is beautiful and attractive and then becomes attached to it. For example, as oil that has been soaked into a piece of cloth is difficult to remove, in the same way, attachment spreads out and it adhere, adheres to its object of observation, making it difficult to tear oneself away from it. So that's, a, that's an interesting uh, quality of attachment. It's said that be, although between attachment and anger, uh, attachment is more immediately destructive. You create much more negative karma with, with its anger and also you actually, it's kind of like a double whammy. You, anger also uh, destroys the virtue that you've created before. Yet, attachment is more pernicious over the long run because it has a tendency of sinking into the object and, and being very difficult to eradicate. Anger can be eradicated more quickly even though you might feel, if you feel that you, you are an angry personality or someone you know is angry and they can't, they have difficulty overcoming that, actually attachment is much more difficult to overcome. Just look at a, a addictive personality. That's a manifestation. All, all addictive personality, if you're addicted to drugs or what, chocolate, ice cream, Marianne's ice cream, stracciatella is my favorite. Um, what else? Sex. Love. Is there a song, Chris? Attach I'm attached to love or something? There must be something somewhere. It must yeah. Addicted to love. Is there one? Yeah. Addicted to love. How, can you give us the... Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> addicted to love. I'm not sure. I, I know that. Do you know that? You know no, okay. <laughs> so all of... All of, all addictions are uh, manifestations of attachment, and uh, until you recognize uh, the shortcoming of attachment, you're not going to really be motivated to overcome it. So you have to see the shortcomings of it. So here it's not talking, it, it only indirectly talks a little bit about the shortcomings of attachment. I think in one of our other courses, actually in our uh, course that we did last year in our, on our practice day, on uh, mind and mental factors, perhaps? We talked a little bit about this, I'm not sure. Uh, not on mind and mental factors, on my, uh, low risk, huh? So, for, what, first of all, you have to recognize the afflictions. So you have to identify what is attachment and what is not. Just liking something is not necessarily attachment. Finding something attractive is not necessarily, you shouldn't feel guilty, oh, I found that attractive. You know? That's not attachment. Attachment is when you exaggerate the qualities of something, having experienced something is attractive, and then the desire to, in, having inappropriately attended to that, arising, uh, having acted, attachment can arise in wanting to get it, keep it. So first you have to identify what it is, then you have to sh see the shortcomings. That's the second step in overcoming the delusions. Like say the addictive personality. Until you recognize really thoroughly the, the, the uh, defects, you're not going to be really motivated to overcome it. You can do super fit, you can do the, this program and that program, nine steps or 12 steps to 13 steps, I don't know how many steps you take, but you will not <laughs> overcome your addiction and attachment. Uh, one of our former monks, Dr. Nick Ribush, who 
uh, is in, in charge of the Wisdom Archives nowadays. He um, gave a course some years ago around the world called Kick the Habit. It's kind of nice. About, uh, you know, for people to help overcome addictive personality. And I remember when he gave it in England, I was there at Manjushri Institute, and there was one lady who used to smoke, I don't know, we'll see now how many packs of cigarettes she smoked a day. I think she smoked two or three packs of cigarettes a day. She was a mother. Her hus she had a husband that went to work, and she smoked. And it was obviously, it was very bad for her. And so she came, and the, the, she, she decided to do this course, and somehow they put her as the poster child for the course, well, the poster lady for the course. So the newspaper came out, and they wanted to do it before and after. And so I think with a little bit eight worldly dharmas and wanting to be famous, she, at the end, she, you know, the last day she didn't have one cigarette. She went from, in the, in the one week course, she went from two packs a day to nothing. And of course, the next day <laughs> she started smoking again because she hadn't really seen the defects. It was motivated by something else. Sometimes someone is pushing us into something or uh, maybe we want to you know, we lose weight or we want to, you know, something else. It's, we don't really see the defects of something. Well, so first you have to recognize the delusions, see the, the defects of them, then apply the antidote. You have to know what the antidotes are and apply them. So the, the to, for attachment, there are various ways that our mind projects onto something which is otherwise neutral. You know, a, a, a cat sees what we find attractive, or a Martian sees what we find attractive. They don't. They don't necessarily find it attractive. They might find something else we find. Like I gave the example before, excrement. A dog might find that very attractive. But you don't find that attractive, right? I don't think anyone here finds excrement attractive. I don't know. So, uh, yes? Well, the different stages, I think, in overcoming all of the, all of the afflictions in, the, in uh, some of the teachings on, if you really think, how am, I, how am I temporarily, temporarily going to overcome attachment, hatred, pride, doubt, all these other delusions and, and a kind of bewilderment. I first of all have to see them as enemies. I have to see their shortcomings. Otherwise, if you see them as friends, like attachment, attachment is very easy to see as a friend, right? We're, we're happy when others are attached to us often. And in our own attachment, we think that's what gets me, that's what drives me. What's it called in the world of business or competition? Com competitive drive or something like that or? You know, the desire to, to fulfill the American dream. Oh, don't get me on that, I'm sorry. Uh, the American dream. Um, to, see, to, to recognize them, first of all, you have to recognize what's what. What is attachment, what isn't. Then once you've recognized the target, to see its defects. So it takes a long time. Who was it that said something about they didn't see something as attractive any longer, was it? I can't remember. At the beginning, when I was asking some questions, someone. Frank, oh, oh no, uh, D, yeah. D said uh, about attachment. He said, "Oh no, right." So you've seen from experience. So it's some kind. We need some experience, and of course, let's say an alcoholic or a drug addict or ourself, who are we are all addicted and attached to various kinds of things. Actually, we have the experience, but we're not attending to it in the right way. We haven't recognized its ill effects. Because sometimes other karma, you know, because we're attached to something, we get some pleasure back, so we don't recognize yet the shortcomings of that. So that, that way attachment is quite insidious. Anger, we usually see the defects of it more quickly. So between anger and attachment, anger is easier to remove in the short term. It doesn't last, it, episodes of anger don't last long periods of time. Attachment can last a long time because it's like oil that's sunk into, a, like in the, in the tablecloth in the Italian restaurant, if you knock the olive oil over and it spills on it, you can't just sort of go like this. The waiter is going to see that spot, right? You have to move, if you're skillful, <laughs> you can't just get, whereas if you, if you, if you tip over the salt, if you, if you, the salt, you can sweep off the table. 
So it is ex the example that's sometimes given is that um, anger is like sand or salt fallen on a cloth that can be easily eliminated. It's very destructive, but it can be eliminated more quickly. Attachment is more insidious. And in some ways, maybe in the Theravada, that's why in some of the traditions they say desire, longing, which is the, long, the, the different kinds of longing, longing to take rebirth, for instance, longing not to be annihilated, that kind of desire, they take as the root of cyclic existence from some of Buddha's teachings. But really, if you look back at it, there's something more fundamental than that. So attachment is of three types. Attachment to the desire realm, the form realm, and the formless realm. When uh, Rupa Rinpoche was mentioning this weekend about attaining, last weekend, about calm abiding, when you achieve calm abiding, have you abandoned the attachment of the desire realm? Yeah. You've abandoned it. So there is some terminology a little bit like that, but it's not actual abandonment in the sense of a cessation, that you've ceased attachment. When you achieve tranquil abiding, because you can fall from tranquil abiding, if you'd really abandoned att attachment to the desire realm from the root, then even you fell from the tranquil abiding, you no longer had that because you got involved in worldly activities again and you lost your concentration. If you'd actually abandoned it, it would not come back again. But that's just, that's called a separation of attachment, in, in, at, abandonment in the sense of it, separation from attachment to the desire realm. <clears throat> that can, so that's why a person who's achieved tranquil abiding might seem completely, from our, you know, with respect to us, incredibly peaceful and un, unaffected by, you know, the things that, uh, cause us to be buffeted around the things, the objects of attachment. There's attachment to the form realm, though, even if one achieves tranquil abiding. And of course, um, or let's say the first concentration or the, the concentrations, the absorptions of the formless realm, there's still attachment of the formless realm. That's why in the Abhidharma Kosha, it says next here, is the treasury of knowledge divides attachment into two. It says attachment of the desire realm attachment to existence, that means cyclic existence, that means, in this case, it means the upper two realms because this is to overcome, that division is helped to understand that unlike some of the uh, non-Buddha schools, uh, even the teachers of the Buddha, when he was, you know, when he had left home, he had two Vedic teachers, right, who taught about how to achieve the concentrations of the form realm and another who taught about how to achieve the concentrations, the absorptions of the formless realm. But still, not those realms are only separated from attachment. Achieving those states through concentration, through the mundane, what's called mundane vipassana. Do you remember what that is? Do Christian you know what that is? Mundane vipassana? When you develop, once you've developed tranquil abiding, you can develop on the basis of that what we call penetrative insight or vipassana. And there's two kinds mundane vipassana and supramundane vipassana. Mundane vipassana is one that, anal that allows you to achieve the concentrations and the absorptions, the formless absorptions, what are called in uh, Pali, are called the jhanas. Sometimes the early translators called them the trances, the transic states. It sounds kind of, have you heard that before, Brish? Jhanas, trances. I, I might have mentioned before, when I was in Malaysia some years ago, there was a, a fellow I stayed with somewhere between Kuala Lumpur and Penang uh, who had on his wall a certificate of having attained the jhanas in some summer camp. You know, I think, so I don't know if that was, I think it might have been a bit of a, an exaggeration, but I don't know, possible perhaps. Um, even if you achieve the dhyanas, as it, as it is in Sanskrit, dhyana means concentration. So that's what in Pali is called jhana. Even you achieve the dhyanas, the concentrations of the form realm, or the formless realm absorptions, all you've done is separated from attachment to the lower realms. But you still have attachment of the form realm and the formless realm within your mind if, you've, if you're in the form realm. If you're in the formless realm, you still have attachment of the formless realm. So it says, the treasury of knowledge, Abhidharma Kosha, 
condenses the attachment of the two upper realms, form and formless, into one and takes that to be attachment for cyclic existence. Because the two upper realms are referred to as cyclic existence in order to overcome the mistake of taking the meditative absorptions of the form and formless realm as a path of liberation. So if you, would, if you once having achieved calm abiding, if you were to, <coughs> instead of following the supramundane path, supramundane vipassana, which takes emptiness or selflessness as its object, it analyzes that. Instead, you analyze the grossness of the desire realm and the better quality of the form realm. That's called mundane vipassana. You can achieve these various jhanas, but that itself is not alone a path of liberation, although in some of the non-Buddhist schools it was considered to be moksha. You know what moksha is? I mentioned this before. It's not that coffee that you get done. Okay. Moksha means liberation, right? Liberation. Tarpa in Tibetan. Remember you were asking, someone was asking about tarchin, we had in our other class before, tar, tarpa means, in Tibetan, means moksha, liberation. Yes? The mundane vipassana takes the uh, grossness of the, of the realm that you're presently in compared to the realm that you're trying to achieve. Like say, if you're still a desire realm mind and um, you want to separate from attachment to the desire realm, you think about this short life in the desire realm, the relative, uh, I would say, inadequacies of the desire realm compared to the form realm. The pleasures are more gross, the lifespans are shorter, uh, and you think of the qualities of the upper realm and you analyze this way, and in so doing, you could, set, with that very concentrated mind and, and, and special insight, you can actually separate from attachment to the attachment of the de desire realm to all the delusions of the desire realm so don't we have some examples like that in our own life once you've really seen the shortcomings of something like say if you're in a relationship and it's like a, 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 once you've experienced that something that is unsuitable in it in the relationship and you've thought about it again and again at that point the person who might previously have seemed so attractive to you, you had attachment for them, you can leave easily. Goodbye. If you've really, if you, you know, you can, maybe you can see some analogy like that. The function of attachment is specified as producing suffering for the purpose of making us understand that the root of all suffering within the three realms of cyclic existence is rebirth which connects us to cyclic existence, and the principal cause for rebirth within cyclic existence is attachment, craving itself. So when we talk about craving, grasping, becoming, that's the, you know, the craving for uh, the next life, craving for continued life. That's why in the Theravada, I, th I believe the, uh, when they talk about what's the, the cause of cyclic existence, it's, it's, it's uh, craving. Tanha, I think in Pali, means uh, thirst. So it's, it's kind of like thirsting for continued existence. Not wanting to, not wanting to uh, be annihilated, so to speak. So now the second of these root afflictions is anger. And this takes, as I said before, this takes a similar kind of, you know, not the, the reason it, it arises is similar to attachment in that it observes something, but in this case it observes something which is experienced on your aggregates as unattractive due to your karma. Might be someone saying harsh words, or your suitcase has been lost, or you, you know, your baby's left you, or whatever. And having perceived that, you project upon it faults instead of good qualities that it does not have, thereby intensifying the underlying feeling of unease about this until the mind becomes disturbed and anger ensues that wants to strike out. And there are different kinds of objects. Here in the, in the text it says that the various kinds of objects of anger are uh, other beings, suffering, 
like say, you're, sometimes we could be a angry at the suffering itself because that's unpleasant, isn't it? Just the suffering within us. Oh, I don't know what, what word you'd say? You know, you have a toothache. Uh, and the causes, or migraine. If you have a migraine, you get angry at the migraine, the suffering. And you can get angry at the causes of the of your suffering. Like sometimes people, uh, what do they do? They they break things that have caused them some suffering. You know, you take a baseball bat and you break something that has caused you some suffering. A computer, maybe. You know, or come into the come into the computer lab and you with a machine gun and you shoot all the computers that have the causes of your suffering. Of course, the sentient beings can be be perceived as the causes of your suffering too. So anger, anger is much more uh, harmful than, this is, this, is the first, this is sort of the identification of anger. Anger is not just a state in which you feel unpleasant. It's actually when your mind has exaggerated the unpleasant nature of that beyond what is reasonable and wants to strike out and eliminate that. So that's an identification of anger. Then you have to recognize the shortcomings. There are many shortcomings of anger, right? Sometimes people, when, when we ask about, in meditation courses, whether people see that anger is a problem, and they say, actually, you need anger. Anger is good. You need anger. Otherwise, people take advantage of you, right? In this day and age. What do you think, Venable? If you didn't get angry once in a while, the, you know, the people would take advantage of you. They'd just take you for a softy or push over. I think wisdom is more helpful than anger. Is more helpful, but anger is helpful, is that right? Um, so because you said more helpful, no, that implies that anger is helpful, right? Mm, so I'll rephrase that then. <laughs> <laughs> I think people believe that some kind of wisdom comes from anger. Uh -huh. So as a result, they feel that or is that right? Okay, that's interesting. I've never heard that before. Do people think wisdom comes from anger, or, or do they think that some dynamism comes from anger? Well, my experience is sometimes when you get angry in the moment, your mind can appear to be a little bit clearer and sharper. Wow, I've never experienced that. I've, I've always heard people say and, and, uh, that when they're angry, they're able to overcome their inhibitions to doing, they'll say things that they might not otherwise say, and maybe they feel a certain release. Because when anger arises, you feel a certain tension within you. And of course, the alternatives to letting it out seem unattractive, just repressing it, right? This is what our society has always gone through, periods of either repression or expression, also of, of attachment. We, t we talked about this before, didn't we? What's an age which where attachment was repressed as the whole society in the West? The age. It starts with a V. The Victorian. The Victorian. And which which uh, decade was the was the decade in Southern California when people just let attachment out? Nineteen sixties. Okay, something like sixties, seventies, seventies and eighties, nineties. The the first. First four years of, <laughs> yeah, all those other years also. Attachment uh, like that and also anger. We often think uh, in the West, and we go through periods in our own development where we express anger, maybe, and then we're disciplined, so we repress it, and then that feels uncomfortable and we feel unnatural. Sometimes if you repress things, they come out some other way. So the Buddhist approach is completely different. It doesn't say it's good to repress your anger. You know, so, sometimes if monks or nuns get angry, uh, sometimes lay people who don't know much about Buddhism, they say, oh, really? Monks are not supposed to get angry. Or, you know, nuns are not supposed to have attachment. You know, I mean, no one should, you know, ideally should have attachment or anger. But it's not so much that that's our vow not to have these mental states. Our vow is not to have uh, the physical and verbal manifestations of these things. Um, so the Buddhism takes a completely different view of uh, how to deal with anger and attachment. Not repressing, not expressing, but a middle way. That's what the middle way, one, one kind of understanding of it. What does that mean? 
you kind of let the anger out a little? <laughs> what do you think, Chris? Do you know what, what would be the middle way in dealing with anger from this perspective? Eliminating anger from your mind, yeah. But here, let's say, if I said it in a, in a more philosophical way, that's, that's exactly precise. I think that's right. That's the meaning of what one should do. Rather than needing to hold it in or needing to let it out, the alternative is getting rid of it completely so it's not there. Like, this, like the th storm clouds in the sky, you might think either it's going to rain or it's the clouds are going to stay there. But there's another alternative. The sun can come and evaporate them, or the wind can come and blow them away. So with the, the sun of wisdom is, is the example that's given in the scriptures. With the sun of wisdom in our mind to cause the anger to dissipate so it's no longer there. So applying the antidotes through wisdom. And you do you know, can you think of an example like that? Do you fellows ever get angry? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, okay, good. I'm glad. Do you, do you ever get angry? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, honest guys. Okay, good. I'm glad. So that sometimes that people say, "I never get angry." I'm. Oh, your your ego gets. It. You don't get angry. Your ego gets angry. Okay. Well, I might have a might have an issue with that. But anyway, um, let's see. What was I saying? I forgot what I was saying. Anger, maybe some form of survival. So if, uh, if we eliminate anger, it doesn't mean that we can't be resolute, that we can't be decisive, and we can't act actively. There's a, in fact, contrary to what Venerable had said at the beginning, although she recanted her explanation, um, I don't believe that anger makes the mind clear at all. Usually when you're angry, the mind, because anger is an affliction, a klesha, the mind is shaken and you don't really see things clearly and you, you do things that later you regret. You would have, you said, why, didn't I, why did I do that? I know I shouldn't have done that. You say words out of anger that later, you know, the relationship that you've built on trust over decades perhaps, or many years, in an instant is destroyed. The trust, you know, even you apologize afterwards, it's not the same. If, for instance, uh, you have to act decisively, wouldn't it be better to be able to act decisively without anger, clouding your judgment? You see injustice, you see that something has to be done, and you can be activated to do that. But if you get angry about it, that's going to actually prevent you from really doing a good job. That's the point. So that's, this is in the first point when we are talking about before, identifying anger. The first thing, identifying. So, uh, being resolute, you know, say the tax dri uh, taxi driver gives you, uh, you know, for the $100 bill you give him, for the, the $10 ride he gives you, or for the $9 ride he gives you $1 back, as though you gave him a $10 bill. You, and you might think, oh, I'm a Buddhist, I can't get angry, therefore I'm leaving. <laughs> you, know, you can say, excuse me. Uh, that's a hundred dollar bill I just gave you. You know, you can be resolute, but if you get angry about it, obviously uh, that can, you can destroy the virtuous karma that you've created over a long period of time. That's one of the great shortcomings of anger. Besides creating negative karma for yourself to experience aggression of others, you destroy virtuous karma that you've created over a long period of time. using strength and decisiveness mm -hmm. as opposed to anger. Because I think what people seek a lot is that strength and get kind of confused in anger. When you get, you, you, can, you can still, like say bodhisattvas who feel compassion for others, uh, they could be motivated and uh, by that motivation develop a certain strength and enthusiastic perseverance to do things. There are examples of moms, old, you know, old moms, grandmas, who's, who've held up cars to let their child get out from underneath, you know. I don't think they were angry at that moment. Maybe, maybe 
but they were energized, they were, they were of co compassion. So I don't think, if you think about it, we don't really need to um, think that anger gives us energy. But I think what would give us energy at this moment is a little bit of tea and, you know, cookies or milk or something. So let's take a little break. Okay, so we said there were three kinds of objects of anger that are given here. Sentient beings, one's own suffering, and the sources from which these sufferings arise. Sometimes we talk about the nine bases of malice, maliciousness. So sometimes you might get confused with the three objects of observation and the nine bases of malice. These are the nine causes are um, being senseless misgivings in the three times the three you know in the say someone in the in the past someone harmed me they harmed my friends or they helped my enemies in the present they're harming me they're harming my friends my nation you know my corporation they're helping my enemies in the future there's a fear that they are going to help my enemies harm me harm my friends so they say these three objects in the three times those are called the nine bases of malice. So that's a little bit different than the objects, objects of observation of anger, right? You see that. So it's different, different enumerations. Anger is said in the Lamarim Chemo, anger is a malicious mind, a harsh mind that observes sentient beings, refers to them or, you know, takes them as their referent object. Ob observed objects, sentient beings, suffering, and the sources of suffering. Sources of suffering, such things as weapons and thorns. What else? Loud noises. What else do you get angry at? Thunderstorms. And intends to harm those objects. Computers, like we said before. It has the function of causing one not to abide in happiness in this lifetime and produces immeasurable suffering in future lives. In this vein, and the Bodhisattva Charya Vatara, it says, if one maintains a painful mind of hatred, mind does not experience peace, nor obtain joy and happiness. Sleep does not come, and there is no stability. He saddens. If one, I guess it's one saddens one's friends, gathers them with generosity, but is not served. In brief, joy does not exist in one where anger abides comfortably. There are many, many de defects of anger. Um, we can t you can understand, if you were to really understand it, think about when you get angry, how even if someone makes for you your most uh, pleasurable experience, you know, you, you know, so, he says, oh, come take the sauna with me. You're angry. Or here's, here's your favorite food I've made for you. Or we've, put, we've got, you know, I don't know what else you might like. It doesn't even, when the mind is angry, you can't even enjoy those things. Does that sound like, you were, you were, you were shuddering, Brish. Did you, like you were thinking of that, no? You were thinking of something else. It's probably cold. It's, always, it's cold, okay. Warm up. When you get angry, your expression changes. You uh, you look unattractive. You are un unappealing to be around. People shun you. You become what's called what a type A personality or type one. What do they call it? Type A personality, which is more prone to to high blood pressure, ulcers. Uh, one might say, well, there's a great advantage because then the uh, corporations in Silicon Valley want to hire you <laughs> because uh, to be the, what do they call those positions where you cut out the, the jobs? Uh, what is it called? Henchman. Yeah. Henchman. <laughs> Henchman. Oh. There must be a more, <laughs> more CFO, CFO C F Chief Financial Officer, or Human Resources Defense. <laughs> HRD or something like that. So, you know, the, that's the one who just cut, you know, you're fired, you know, the guy who's worked there for 30 years and is one, one day away from 
retiring and cut them off so they don't get their pension or something? Do you have to have a type A personality to do that? They do it without anger. If they did it without anger, but uh, I think it, uh, the, the people who are often like that, if you check, the people that they seek are people that are type A personalities who are prone to anger. But those are only the, as we, and we said, the other defects also. Uh, you know, you ruin relationships that you engendered, loving relationships you'd engendered over long periods of time and so forth. But the, the hidden, the worst defects of anger are the hidden ones because uh, you create karma just as you do with all the klesha. Uh, all, not all, yeah, all the klesha create karma, but uh, in particular, you create negative karma of feeling aggression of others, which is very unpleasant. But even more so, it's like, as I said before, like a double whammy, you know, both, both ends, a double-edged sword. You not only create negative karma, you uh, destroy virtue that you have created in the past due to anger. Anger is likened to a fire that creates uh, the causes to destroy the roots of virtue, either so that they are... Uh, destroyed so they don't ripen at all. It's very hard to have that kind of situation. Usually what you do is you postpone their ripening or you diminish their intensity of the virtue that you've created. So even bodhisattvas who have not yet attained the path of seeing, who might have moments of anger, that can postpone their realization of spiritual insights and accomplishments because of anger. So it's a heavy-duty thing. Okay, so I'm going to skip some of these stanzas from the Jataka Tales and go on to the next one, Pride. Oh wait, if we're gone, what's the what are the antidotes to anger? Meditate on love. Meditate on karma. That being has been your mother, so that's related to love or something, right? So meditate on karma. How does that affect, how does that uh, help you overcome anger? Seeing the uh, negative effects of anger. So if someone's getting angry, you just say to them, karma, it's your karma. Uh, it, most people, that'll make, them, <laughs> <laughs> that'll make them more angry, right? So you, you say, indeed, you have, it's not like you can tell others that's your karma. You have to meditate. So uh, this is what I was telling you before. Atisha had a, an oral tradition that the Kadampa Geshe's carried on. Um, it was, uh, there were four methods because in the same sense that we projected qualities on things that exacerbated our attachment, caused our attachment to flare. In the same way, we project upon things faults that are not really there that causes our anger to get l larger. So one of them was called the arrow and the target. That was the name, I think, in this oral tradition, which has to do with karma. It means to, to think, uh, the, well, to recognize that one of the things that causes your anger to rise is the thought that this is just, you know, this is someone else's fault. You know, it's, you know, it's George's fault. You know, you made a big mistake, George. Not you, George. It's George. You know. And... Uh, you know, it's or it's someone else's fault, and and not recognizing the karmic causation. So the the idea of, of arrow in the target. Can you imagine what that means? Even you have set up. Even there are targets. You know, even there are conditions for uh, unpleasantness. Unless you created the karma in the past, like an arrow that's been going some distance. Uh, even when you encounter that target. You won't experience anything unless you shot the arrow, unless you created the cause. That's kind of, I think that's kind of the one interpretation of that. So to use the meditation on karma to help understand the situation that is, might be irritating to you, to recognize this is the fruit of your own karma. If you want to be happy, you have to avoid creating the causes of anger, uh, causes of suffering. By getting angry, you're not, you're not only going to create more causes of suffering, but you're going to eliminate the causes of happiness. Also to think the uh, other beings are not the principal cause 
of your suffering. They're only cooperative causes. And by you getting angry at them, you're harming them needlessly. They don't have to be harmed. So there's one, one of the antidotes. So overcome the idea that the other person uh, is the cause, is the real cause, They're, or you know, whatever, or the other thing. Another, another projection we have is that um, phenomena, that, that suffering is permanent. You know, like when the, the, the fly is flying around your head, getting angry, whatever it might be. One of the things that acts to instigate the anger, because as, as we said, several of you thought there were different causes of anger, um, that causes the irritation to rise is the thought that this unpleasantness will remain. Just to think of impermanence. This will pass. I remember when I was in uh, Lebanon many years ago, uh, I had read with a friend of mine a lot of Sufi literature, and I remember we were both, we both liked this one, sort of the culmination of some Sufi story from Idris Shah's collected works or something. This too will pass. So my friend, Steve, had, uh, he'd invited a friend of his from uh, America, from South Carolina. The reason I know the guy was from South Carolina is because his name was Fireball. And uh, when I told people later, I wasn't sure if it was North Carolina or South Carolina, I said, no, no, it's South Carolina. If his name is Fireball. <laughs> and uh, I hope no one from South Carolina sees this. <laughs> they might be offended. Anyway, Fireball had this plan. He seemed, they wanted to export uh, from Lebanon, Beirut, they wanted to export supposedly pigeons back to the States. And I thought this was completely crazy. What, what kind of, you know, they were into carrier pigeons. I thought this is so stupid. Turns out they had, he had gotten my friend Steve in, kind of embroiled in this plan to, um, what's the word when you, when you send things illegally, drugs? Smuggle. Smuggle. Um, hashish, which is very common in Lebanon, and they were going to they would roll it out and they would make laminated cages for the pigeons, one layer of wood, one layer of hashish, like this. And they figured Fireball figured that the smell of the pigeons would keep the this was back in the the early 70s keep the guards away. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, the Muslim carpenter that they got to make the cages was completely suspicious, called the police, and the police raided the house where they had all of this stuff. And they, Fireball and Steve, were brought to prison. And I uh, tried to intercede on Steve's behalf with some, you know, one of these uh, sleazy lawyers. And uh, anyway, to make a long story short, I went to the prison where I had heard already he'd been accosted, he's a good-looking guy, accosted by some prisoners. And after a couple of days, he was able to come out to some holding cell outside with these big bars like a like tiger cage or something and uh, I said Steve how are you doing you know wh how's it going and he looked at me and he said this too will pass so somehow that had been a great that idea that understanding had been a great solace you know somehow had helped his mind from getting depressed or angry so to recognize whatever whatever experience you have that suffering, that will pass. You know, Mark's migraine passed, hopefully. It looks a little bit better, much better. That can help. This is the second one. Third one, let's say, is the idea, the projection, to overcome the projection that the other being, uh, let's say, the situation, you don't need. Do you ever use this expression? Excuse me, I don't need this. I've heard that on some TV series once. You ever heard that? I don't need this. Do your kids say that, Brish? They probably don't use that. Your kids are very well behaved. Yeah. Do you, have you ever heard that? <laughs> you say it to your dog. I don't need this. I think you see it sometime when there's two, a couple arguing and, and one of them, you know, is the other one says, I don't need this. Oftentimes we think, I don't need this suffering, as though life owes us a living, as my father used to say. Or what, what do they used to say in Europe? Life is not a rose garden? Or what do they? Not life is not a rose garden. What do they say? I didn't promise you a rose garden. Actually, um, Scott Peck, 
uh, who wrote the, the book that probably 99% uh, of all air travelers have read because it's sold in every airport in, in the world, The Road Less Traveled. You know that? that very good um, sense in there that he found from his own uh, therapy, he's a Christian therapist, psych psychologist, or psych psychoanalyst, uh, that many people's problems were due to the fact that they expected that life should not have any problems. And when any problem came, it became, you know, insurmountable, sort of like a surprise. If you recognize, as, the, as we find in the Lan Rim, in the teachings of all of Buddha's teachings, while you're in cycl cyclic existence, it's the nature of cyclic existence to be suffering. You can begin to overcome that you can begin to, to have this, this frame of mind, to recognize, instead of thinking, I don't need this when suffering occurs, to think, hey, I need this. To recognize the suffering as your guru, is how in Atisha's oral tran uh, transmission it said, to recognize the adverse condition as your guru. This is giving you the opportunity to develop renunciation, to develop patience, to recognize the suffering nature of samsara, rather than thinking, oh, this is nothing good about this is all. I don't need this. Actually think, I need this. It's not as though as some kind of modern uh, philosophies or whatever you call it, they say, before you take rebirth, you decide where you're going to take rebirth because you know there are certain lessons you have to learn from Buddha's perspective, that's not it. You're thrown by your karma, but maybe in a similar kind of thing, there are lessons that we have to learn, and we're going to be, we're going to experience that suffering again and again until we don't respond to them in karmically potent ways that create the causes for them again, right? You know, we create that circle, cyclic existence. So to recognize the, the cause of your anger is your guru. This is you, the other person who is baiting you, you know, insulting you, have, have abused you with faults that you don't have at all. You've done something good, and they've actually criticized you. They're your guru. Actually, it would be very, very powerful. But how's it, because how's a guru act? The guru isn't always the one who goes, Oh, Dorche, you are so wonderful. You know, I am going to lead you just the peaceful path to enlightenment. It seems that way. We want to have the guru. We think the guru, you know, is always the loving one. But sometimes, anyone who's wrathful with us, we think, oh, they're not a guru. They, they're, they're wrathful. Actually, my teacher, Lama Yeshe, me, people used to think, oh, Lama is so loving. But to those disciples who were with Lama for a long time, who were his close disciples, Lama would be very wrathful. Just as Elizabeth was saying, Lisa was saying before about an uh, intelligent teacher out of compassion, wanting to help students, knowing that you know, so feeling so much compassion of them, dawdling along. Sometimes you have to kick them. Maybe you know, you have to you have to be wrathful with them, not out of anger, out of out of compassion. So to think this untoward occurrence toward you is your guru. Helping you in the path. I need this, you think, you know, rather than I don't, you know, excuse me, I don't need this, not. And then the fourth one, you can think uh, compassion, which is the antidote to the projection that thinks the other person is suitable to be harmed. So that sounds too technical, or they needed it, you know. Some, someone says, why did you, why did you, you know, you just you know, bl blasted them, you just hurt them, you s hurt their feelings, you said these harsh words, and then we, we very blithely say, they needed that. Have you ever heard that? Have you ever used that? <laughs> they needed that. Actually, if you think other sentient beings are exactly the same as yourself, you know, do you like to be criticized? Maybe if you're, you know, if you've seen the wrathful guru as your, you know, aid, maybe we, you, you relish criticism, but usually we don't like to be criticized for anything. Even I spill <laughs> ink on your Persian carpet, I'd like you to say, oh, don't worry, it needed to be cleaned anyway. You know, I break your Ming vase or something like that. 
we want to be loved, we want to feel secure. Other sentient beings are exactly the same. So to develop compassion is an exact antidote to thinking through the violent mind. Remember when we talked about violence, nonviolence was of the, of the nature of compassion, of the, of the mind that wants to preclude harming others. Instead of the mind that's ready, you know, they really deserve it. You know, it's ready to engage in harm. The mind that's always hesitant to engage in harm because we know what harm is like for ourself. This is the fruit of meditating. When you experience suffering, meditate. This is due to my karma. This is unpleasant while I'm in cyclic existence. All sentient beings are experiencing this. I wish they could be free of it. And when you think of their suffering, think of how unpleasant it is for you when you feel that. Then you have some energy to feel compassion for them, some unbearable nature for them, wanting them to have wisdom, wanting them to get rid of that unclarity of mind that's causing them to act in that way. So those are some of the antidotes, the arrow and the target, karma, to so think about karma, which then you can also relate with compassion. Because uh, if you get, you know, if you get angry with someone else, if you harm someone else, you create a cooperative condition for them to create more karma. Or you yourself are the cooperative condition for them originally to steal from you or harm you or say these things because you created the karma in the past. You're the cause of their suffering. So arrow in the target, uh, what did we say? Impermanence, which c you could extend to the wisdom of emptiness also. Basically, that's, that's the higher wisdoms of impermanence and emptiness. To see the situation as your guru, guru devotion in all its multifaceted sense, see, to see the situation as not something that, you know, while you're in cyclic existence, this is the nature and this is teaching you. As you're aware, like Milarepa, everything becomes a lesson. When Milarepa brought his, his uh, bowl, his clay bowl, that had been encrusted with nettles, right? You remember this story? That, he, that was his only possession other than a white little cloth and he brought it down to get some water and it fell on a rock and broke. And all that was left was a sort of the imprint of the nettles shaped like the bowl, you know. And instead of being upset, he immediately felt joy that life was, you know, this was teaching him, you know, when the, when the gross body is gone, still the subtle body continues, something like this, you know. So every, as, as you get familiar with the Dharma, everything that you encounter you see a dead sparrow and you think, like that, I'm, I'm going to die. You, know? you see the leaves falling, you think of impermanence. And, and uh, you see other people suffering and you have, you, it develops, it becomes a cause of compassion for you. So to see the situation as your guru and finally to meditate on compassion to overcome the tendency to strike out and think that sentient beings need that you know, suffering. They don't need it. We don't need it. For me, I'm not very involved, so... <laughs> You're not very involved? No. With what? So sorry. With what? Evil. Evil. Oh, evolved. That's evolved. <laughs> At times, for example, this is all, this makes sense to me, and sometimes I feel like I'm dying when I have to put the brakes on. You know what I mean? Like, the brakes on what? Uh, with anger. Like, for example, someone just said something bad about me recently, mm -hmm. and my thoughts were, Oh, karma ripening, all this, you know, understanding mm -hmm. from a Buddhist perspective. And yet, the train, you know, the train, the train of thoughts. So what that means, what, what we're talking about here is the, the winds of karma. So one of the, what we have to, over, uh, to understand that we can't mentally decide the change and affect that immediately. What we have to do is to have a strength of mind that's supported by uh, a collection of merit. So it takes time, but even, even, even while you're getting angry, if you're recognizing, I shouldn't be doing this, I, and, and to be aware of the evolution of what's happening, or say you, you fall prey to lust and you follow it, and just to recognize it's not really happiness. At that point, the karma that you're creating is not, as you're not relishing, you're not rejoicing in the activity, it's not a full fully-fledged karma that's going to have all of the ramifications that it would otherwise. It's, it makes it much easier to purify later, like, for instance, a boulder that already has a crack in it, 
is much easier to, to get off the road than one that's all, you know, there's one big boulder, you know. It's already begun to get more manageable. So not to feel, not to be heavy with ourselves, to recognize uh, that just like a, even our little, little flame of wisdom, like a little candle flame of wisdom that we generate through some practice, easily blown out, even completely blown out by the winds of karma, and we have to regenerate it with effort. But regenerating it with effort again and again, it will become stable and will be, as the winds of, of our karma begin to subside and our flame of wisdom gets bigger, it will become indestructible. Recognize again when we're talking about this is a different paradigm when we talk about the middle way. It's not a matter of repressing because if you if you think I'm a Buddhist I can't get angry or even if you have a rationale I can't get angry because I create negative karma and you're holding it in. That's not that itself is not the whole thing. You have to use that wisdom to look at the situation and see what is instigating the anger. The thinking like say for instance uh, to think. I am being abused without cause. Actually, I've done right, and the people are criticizing me. There's no way you could be criticized unless you created the karma in the past. So then at that moment, it takes on a whole different tenor, tenor, sort of like, sort of looking at it and sort of marveling, wow, you know, look at that. This is karma in action. If I want to avoid this, I have to avoid harming others verbally, you know? I have to avoid all of these things in the future. And this is a great, this is my guru helping me purify that negative karma. Now that karma is gone. If I don't respond with anger, I'm ahead. Now to use your businesswoman's mind, you know, businessman's mind, you know, thinking, hmm, calculating. Okay, negative karma gone, no creation of virtue, negative karma, new negative karma, hey, I'm ahead, you know? And if you do it with some good virtuous motivation for the benefit of others, you know, you even create, you know, vast store of virtue. So let's go on. Pride, next one. Um, sometimes, in, sometimes people think the five root delusions are ignorance, attachment, anger, pride, and jealousy. The, the, when we talk about the five non-views. But it's not jealousy, it's doubt. Where does jealousy come from? Where do people have that idea? The fifth one is jealousy. Pardon? No, pride and jealousy. Anger is a, a, a ignorance, attachment, anger, pride, and jealousy. Because in Tantra, we talk about the five aggregates. They're associated with that. So that's a different, that's, that's a little bit different. So don't get confused. Here, pride is one, but the other one jealous, is not jealousy, is doubt. We'll see, afflicted doubt. So pride... Tibetan Nga Gyal. Nga means I. Gel is short for Gelpo, maybe. King is always like, I am great. Kind of, that's how the Tibetans have put it, the etymology. I think it's kind of, kind of cute. What is pride? It is a puffing up of the mind independence on the view of the transitory collection. Now, we've mentioned that we haven't come to the the views yet, but the, the view of the transitory collection is a cause of pride. It has the function of acting as a support for disrespect and suffering. Some of the lamas say that uh, pride is one of the greatest obstacles to making realizations because, it, as it was as said, I think maybe Rinpoche said recently, in the spring, uh, when the grass first begins to grow, it grows in the valley. And as the summer progresses, it grows along the sides of the hills. But the grass never grows on the snowy peaks. So it means realization grows first in the humble mind, the low mind. And only later, after a long period of time, in the mind of someone who's got a little bit of pride but hasn't eliminated it yet. But it never grows. Realization never grows in the haughty mind. Because humility, the opposite of pride, pride is, is an obstacle because... You don't, you're not a receptacle. 
for the teachings in general, if you just talk about teachings, and also you're putting yourself in a situation where you're creating negative karma, acting as a, a barrier between yourself and others, very difficult to, ve to develop compassion and so forth. As been said above, it's a mental factor that has the aspect of puffing up. A, what's the word? Like a balloon. What do we call it? Not puffing up. What do you call it? Inflated. Inflate, yeah, that's, that's another way of translating this. In inflated mind, once one observes the basis for the inflation, th things such as one's own wealth, people, sometimes people are proud of their wealth, right? Around here, there's a lot of, you know, wealthy entrepreneurs. Um, qualities, you know, maybe beauty or what, intelligence or something like that. Education. One can be proud of one's education. One's lineage, where would that take place? Only in India, if you're Brahmin? Where else? Native Americans do it here. Na it could be Native Americans, but it could also be, you know, I'm a Catholic, or, or you know, say religion, I'm a this, or I'm a, I'm a uh, O'Flaherty, or I, you know, I'm a Caton, or I don't know what <laughs> I'm just doing. I'm a, what would you have? I, I'm a, um, what's your name? Greenberg. I'm a Greenberg. Uh, the Greenbergs never do such things. The Greenbergs, you know. One can have pride in different kinds of things like that. And what it, what it amounts to is because of, instigated by the wrong view of the transitory collection, a real sense of I, viewing the conventionally existent I as truly existent, then whatever qualities one attributes to that, inflating causes one's an, one's opinion of oneself to become inflated, like a big balloon, okay? You can often see, wh what's the archetypal position of the head for someone who's pry proud? <laughs> like this, right? Oh, nose, like this? No. <laughs> nose, nose in the air, you know, the archetypal proud person, right? I'm not sure what she meant, but anyway, <laughs> I'm not gonna ask. Okay. Pr uh, so, the Lanrim Chemo says, pride is based on the view of the transitory collection and is an inflation of the mind, an inflated mind, once one observes an external or internal phenomenon that is high or low, good or bad, it involves an a aspect of loftiness. You can actually have pride in being low, in some cases, so it, it, it depends. Independence on the view of the transitory collection is specified because all pride is generated in the dependence on the innate conception which thinks I. Remember, the view of the transitory collection doesn't think you. That would be a, a, a case of self-grasping, right? You. You, Dorchi, are the source of my pride. You. Or you have helped me so much. I love you. That would be a case of self-grasping, grasping to a self of others. That's not the view of the transitory collection. It's talking about I or mine, the view of the transitory collection. Pride is of seven types. So here, I'm not going to go into detail about this. We can, we can go over it again later. There are different lists. Uh, the names are more or less the same, but sometimes the explanations are slightly different in different texts. Nargajuna's text that is quotes here, the precious garland, may be a little bit different than is what is here. But generally, they, you have a list similar to this. Pride, exceeding pride, or say exceptional pride, pride beyond pride, pride that thinks I, pr uh, pride of vanity, pride of slight inferiority, and wrongful pride. Here, the pride of slight inferiority is the one that thinks uh, you're almost, you know, even though you're lower than the Dalai Lama, you're higher than everyone else. You know, you're pretty close, you know. You know, oh, I'm lower than the Dalai Lama, but, you know, just barely. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong pride here, it says, is inflation of the mind thinking that one has attained excellent qualities when one has actually gone astray. And sometimes people are proud of things that are actually not objects, not even good qualities in a conventional sense. So I'm not going to go over these right now, although they, they could be, it can be very useful to think of these. Pride is the function of obscuring new attainments of the Dharma, 
of scripture and realization. Remember I said that the grass grows lowest in the valley in the, in the spring. It, it has the function of obscuring this due to its disrespect for those who possess excellent qualities. It causes rebirth and bad migrations in future lives, and even when reborn as a human, acts as a cause for rebirth and low caste, and as a servant and the like. So there's a famous story of one of the, one of the great beings of the past who became, he was a, I, I think, uh, how did it go? He was in the God realm, I, I don't know exactly now. I think he fell from the God realm and was reborn as a Chakravartin king, or vice versa, he went from a Chakravartin king to the God realm. But anyway, when he fell, he was born as the servant of a servant. Yeah. Like, some, it, like when you see servants, you, usually people who, are, who serve others, are in a sub, they don't have their full control, right, of their life. They may be happy, but they, they, they don't have what would, one would say, usually in a worldly sense, optimum kind of conditions. So the servant of servants, if you think in like ancient times, the servant of, if a servant goes home and their servant is like really low, right? The causes, the results of being proud are to be born in low, low status, you know, you know, not respected by others. The causes of being held in high esteem by others is your own humility in past lives. So if you want to, to be able to have that kind of quality to be able to benefit others, some of these ripening qualities as taught in the Lan Rim that allow you to help sentient beings, so that to be held in esteem by others so that your words and your actions are noticed by others and they hold them in esteem, you should practice humility now for the welfare of others, thinking I'm doing this to be able to help others in the future. So many ways to overcome pride. In the actual antidotes of pride, once you've identified what pride is, if you notice it in your own mind, oh, I'm getting, actually, I'm getting a little bit inflated mind here. Once you recognize it and its defects, then to apply the antidotes, uh, although in the Lan Rim sometimes, or in the, uh, the Buddhist scriptures, it says the antidote to pride is to meditate on the aggregates, the entrances and the datus and all of the various combinations in the various realms. It's very complicated things because if you do so, your own pride goes down because you can't understand these things well. But in a practical sense, when I asked my teacher Lama Yeshe once, what's, what's the best antidote to pride? Lama said, heartwarming love. Best antidote to pride. Why? Because say for instance, your mom, can you feel proud with respect to your mom, you know, you're better than your mom if you love your mom? Yeah. You know, there you go, thanks. I needed, needed someone to tell, to say that, good. You're, this is like the Greek chorus. <laughs> Lisa, Lisa's the part of the Greek, we need someone over on this side also. To, no. <laughs> yeah, just think, to want others to be happy to, to feel the closeness and affection for them, how can you feel proud of some little minor accomplishment you have? Now we come to the next one, ignorance. Yeah. So, um, in this last stanza on page 58, mm -hmm. I was talking about deriding myself. Uh, Lama was talking about this, that self-deprecation really is the other side of the world. Or a certain type of pride. Well, this is uh, this is talking about the pride of slight inferiority. This this is this can be interpreted that way. W the question you you had asked the question in San Francisco, right? I'm not sure. Uh, you understand? I'm not sure. Everyone understood what was going on. Um, self. It's not something that unless you understand another culture to use words that we use in our culture, they may not identify with that. Tibetans don't, when his, his holiness has to almost, he acts like he, does, as a, what is this talking about? S low self-esteem? It's not something that was prominent socially in Tibet. But if you talk about it in a deeper sense, all of Tantra, when you talk about 
you know, here we're talking about the root of samsara being ignorance or the wrong view of the transitory collection, the klesha, so forth. In uh, Tantra, there's another flavor of what the causes of our cyclic existence is, is impure view, impure view and, and grasping to that. So impure view is overcome by divine pride. Impure view is, is part of deprecation, so low self-esteem. We all have that. My teacher Lama Yeshe used to say, this is one of the special features of Tantra, of uh, developing divine pride, to see your Buddha nature and then spend a long time meditating on what you can become, what you are already. Not to identify with what you are erroneously conceiving yourself as. That's self-deprecation. We tend to, you know, we, we are completely brainwashed by our advertising industry and I mean our, you know, we believe our parents say, you're dumb, you're dumb, you're dumb, you're a jerk, you're this, you know, whatever. And we tell ourselves that, um, we, the antidote to that kind of self-deprecatory mind, low self-esteem, is to recognize one's potential, even if one is realistic and sees that right now I have certain faults. I'm not, I'm not Einstein, or you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not all the things that I might. You know, other kinds of qualities, wealthy, or have the karma to be. Uh, l loved by others or to be seen as attractive or to be successful. That's my karma, but that can change. I have the potential. And I, recognizing that within oneself it, and imagining oneself in a divine form is a supreme antidote to that low self-esteem. So Lama Zobar Ramesha was just talking, not talking about Tantra there, so he was talking just sort of taking the manifesting sort of surprise, what, what does that mean? You know, sort of acting like he didn't know what you were talking about. But uh, this is well known in, in Buddhism. Low self-esteem is one of the, the main obstacles to the practice of higher, the higher path. So let's go on, because we, we have only one more class after this, right? So ignorance, marigpa, avidya in Sanskrit, avidya, not knowing, or here it actually means, an, uh, there's two kinds of ignorance. There's an ignorance is kind of passive, which is just unknowing, as we'll see in the text, and one which is actively misperceiving, being erroneous. And that's, I said, in general, the higher, higher tenets, the Prasangika, not just the Mahayana in general, but the Prasangika would say, it's that, and also the, Maj, the Majamaka in general would say, it's that active ignorance that is the main ignorance. The subsidiary ignorance, not knowing, main ignorance there is that not knowing the law of cause and effect. So that can cause you to engage in negative actions. Sometimes, like the first link of the 12 links, what kind of ignorance is that? Chris, the 12 links. You know the 12 links? First link is ignorance. That gives rise to karmic formations. So some, some of the tenants say, what gives rise to karmic formations is the ignorance that doesn't know the law of cause and effect, and therefore you engage in negative actions. But that only refers to negative actions. These 12 links, this karmic formations mean any kind of um, contaminated actions, virtuous or non-virtuous. Even virtuous actions cause you to cycle in cyclic existence. So the real uh, ignorance, which is the 12 link ignorance, is a, a misperception of true existence. You know, you know, m viewing oneself as truly existent, viewing, or say, a, un, you know, misunderstanding, grasping to true existence. Actually, when they talk about true the twelve link ignorance, if you really investigate, and some of you might investigate more, if you hear this, twelve link ignorance is said to be the not even the innate ignorance, it's just the intellectually formed ignorance because on the path of seeing, you eradicate that so that you no longer create the same kinds of causes to be born in the lower realms any longer. On the path of seeing, you no longer, after the path of seeing, you no longer create karma to be born in the lower realms, it said. Okay, so let's see. 
What is ignorance? It is unknowing of the three realms. So here, this is the, the definition from the Abhidharma Samuchaya, still mainly taking the unknowing, the passive side. It has the function of acting as a support of the arising of wrong ascertainment or certainty. It has the, the it acts as a support for the arising of doubt and the afflictions with respect to phenomena. As, as has been said above, it is the mental factor of unknowing that is obscured regarding the mode of abiding of all phenomena. So there's two types. Obscuration that is a mental factor of unknowing, not knowing something, such as law of cause and effect, and an awareness that apprehends erroneously. This is the, the principal one. From among the two, the explicit indication in the Abhidharma Samuchaya, the higher Abhidharma, explains ignorance to be the mental factor of unknowing. Even in the an Asanga's text, which is partially from the Chittamatra view, mainly is talking about not knowing this ignorance. And Vashubandhu, his brother, Acharya Vashubandhu in the Abhidharma Kosha, or in, in, explained it the same way in his text called The Discussion of the Five Aggregates. So therefore, the two brothers, Asanga and his brother, agree. Are there any great brothers in our organization anywhere? Sisters? Brothers and sisters? Anyway. Bob and Karuna. Okay, I'll have to tell them that. Yeah? Okay, okay. I'll tell them they're like a Sangha and Vasumandu. Then, I'll, then they'll argue who is... Because one of them... Yeah, one of them, Asanga was, which one was born with a nobler caste? One was born a Brahmin caste, one was born a other caste, right? Asanga was higher caste? Yeah. Well, the father, the same mother, she had, she had the wish to raise some sons that would be, that would change the course of Buddhism, and she married, she had re different husbands. One was a king and one was uh, of a lower caste. Maybe Brahmin. Maybe one was king caste and one was Brahmin caste. I can't remember. However, Dharmakirti asserts that ignorance is an awareness that apprehends erroneously. This is, the, this is the position that we would hold in the Majamaka. In this way, although there are two types of assertions with regard to ignorance, the assertion that it is a wrong conception and the assertion that it is an awareness that does not realize <coughs> are alike in asserting that the principal antidote to ignorance is the wisdom realizing selflessness. So ignorance is of two types. Sounds like we've just said that. Ignorance, which is, that is the obscuration with respect to actions and the results, <clears throat> and ignorance that is an obscuration with respect to the meaning of suchness. What is suchness? It's the nature of phenomena, the ultimate nature of reality, which in the, in, uh, the higher schools we say emptiness. The ignorance that is the obscuration, the first one, with respect to actions and their results, causes one to accumulate actions for rebirth in the lower realms, right? So if you were to say that was the first link of the 12 links, that's very limited because the 12 links would not be telling how you circle in cyclic existence, only how you go to the lower realms. The ignorance that is the obscuration with respect to the meaning of suchness causes one to accumulate actions for circling in the good migrations. Well, also the bad migrations. That, that is ba that's the position if you, without seeing that, uh, say for instance, if you, if, remember in our tenant system, some people say that you can escape from samsara by realizing that the person is empty of being self-supporting, substantially existent, you don't have to realize that the nature of reality, you don't have to realize suchness to escape from samsara, right, the lower tendons. So for them, this, this kind of dichotomy would work because for them to eliminate the ver the uh, causes to create virtuous, contaminated virtuous karma, you would have to realize emptiness. But for the Majamaka, to, that one ignorance is the cause for both creation of negative karma, only in a very distant sense, it's not knowing karma and its results. That's, you know, the unknowing that's the cause to create negative karma. 
But the, it, the immediate cause of creating negative karma is a sense of ego. And the, and the cause of creating contaminated virtue is this also the grasping to oneself as truly existent. Its function, that means ignorance, its function is specified as acting as a support for the arising of wrong ascertainment, doubt, and afflictions with respect to phenomena. Because other afflictions arise in dependence on ignorance. Independence on them, that is, afflictions, actions arise, right? So first there's ignorance. On dependence on that, other aff afflictions arise. Independence on them, we create karma, actions, negative and positive. Independence on those, well, say, yeah, klesha in general, other than ignorance, all the, the, most of the klesha are negative karma. Independence on actions, all suffering of cyclic existence arise. Therefore, all afflictions and faults arise in dependence on ignorance. So the, to me, one of the most powerful quotations in that regard is, as we've, we've seen and will probably see in uh, the presentation on calm abiding and special insight coming up, as Arya Deva said in his 400 stanzas, just as the body sense pervades the whole body, that means it pervades all the other faculties, ignorance pervades all, meaning pervades all the other afflictions. So somehow it is the, the causal, either it's concomitant with them or it precedes them and, and causes, the, instigates those delusions to, um, to rise. So it's like the, the main cause. There's a quotation from Dignaga's Compendium of Valid Cognition, Pramana Samachaya, one who sees the self will constantly adhere to it as I. Due to this adherence, and this is a word I think, Venerable, did you ask last week about adherence? Someone asked. This means ad to adhere here, <laughs> excuse me, to adhere, <laughs> to adhere in this context means to uh, grasp as true, strongly grasp, will constantly adhere to it as I. That means grasp it as truly existent I. Due to this adherence, one will crave for happiness. And due to that craving, faults will be hidden. Okay, so, <coughs> yes. From the right view, at the end of this, his faults will be hidden from view. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, faults will be hidden. I think that means you'll be you won't see the faults due to the craving. You'll crave for happiness, and so you don't see the faults of the adhering to the I. So we've talked about ignorance before. Let's just finish up the last one here on 61, doubt, tesom in Tibetan. When we talked about the ways of knowing, there was one of the ways of knowing was doubt, and there were two different views there. Some of the tenets took doubt to mean the mental factor doubt. Some of the tenets said, no, it didn't have to be the mental factor doubt. In fact, there was a big, there's a big doubt about it, <laughs> excuse me, because here, this is not the mental factor. When we talk about the, the root delusion doubt, this is doubt leaning in which direction? Can it be equal balanced doubt? Here, let's see what it says. What is doubt from the Abhidharma Samachaya? This is being too minded re with regard to the truths. It has the function of acting as a support for not engaging in the class of virtue. Can it be doubt leaning in the right direction? It has, as has been said above, is a mental factor that wavers between two points within observation of the four truths, say, say, you know, it's truth of suffering, being wavering, maybe it's true, maybe it's not. Cause and effect, result, cause and result, and so forth. This doubt hinders all virtuous activities and especially hinders the seeing of the truth. Since it will be overcome when one, one sees the truth, it is said to be a thorough entanglement that is an object of abandonment of the path of seeing. These, um, the thorough entanglements, as he's translating it here, 
view of the transitory collection holding bad morality and conduct is supreme and doubt. These are, although there are many things that are abandoned on the path of seeing, uh, the Buddha mentioned these three in particular because, as Lama Tsongkhapa said in his texts, it's like uh, if you're trying to get to a destination, there are three kinds of impediments to that. Um, not wanting to go, you don't, you don't even start the journey, right? Uh, mistaking the path and un uncertainty which path to take. Something like that. So th those are related with these three views. Um, here, can you, can you say, it, it doesn't mention that it's doubt leaning in the wrong direction. How can you say that it's doubt leaning in the right, wrong direction? I won't say that anymore. No, no. <laughs> you're, doubt, you're in doubt about it now. You mean. It's, because it's, the one in the middle. it's the one in the middle that's this doubt. Then it's not two pointed. If it's in the well, equal balanced doubt still still is of two points. That's the whole point of doubt. It hasn't made up its mind. So you think just that is this deluded doubt? Not sure. Might be in some cases, but but if you have doubt leaning in the right direction, maybe it wasn't exactly translated in a way that I, I thought was exactly precise this last weekend. When Rinpoche was mentioning that is said in the teachings that if you have doubt, even if you have doubt, I don't remember how Fabrizio translated. If you have doubt about emptiness, if you have doubt about emptiness, it shakes the foundation of samsara. What does that mean? It mean yeah. He was I didn't. He was using a different word than doubt. He was trying to make it more colloquial. Um, what it means is not that if you doubt emptiness, oh, I doubt, I doubt it. It doesn't mean that. It means maybe emptiness exists. I don't know. Even to have that kind of doubt, even not even leaning in the right direction, just to have an equal balanced doubt shakes the root of, of your cyclic existence, Le provides the foundation to later to be able to escape from cyclic existence. So let alone to have confidence, you know, a correct belief, and, and to, to actively try to understand that. So we're going to have uh, a difficulty finishing in one more class, but I think what we'll do next time, if you can please read these afflicted views next time, and what we'll try to do is, um, I'll give a very short exposition after those afflicted views. We'll spend most of the class next time talking about the afflicted views and a little review, and just a brief discussion about the 20 secondary mental factors. And then in, when we meet again in March for practice day, we'll have two sessions, and I will we'll have a little time to go over the divisions of those uh, 20 secondary delusions, 20 secondary afflictions, how some of them are related to ignorance, some are related to attachment, some with hatred, uh, with anger. Some, like jealousy, maybe depend on attachment and anger because you're attached to something. When someone else gets it, you feel unpleasant and there's some hatred. And then some that are related with all three. So we'll talk about that later. But right now, we don't have time to actually go any further. I wish we'd had like a couple more lectures. but. That's how it worked out. So we'll, uh, next time we'll talk mainly about the, these last five views. And we'll, go, we'll have a brief discussion about the 20. But don't feel that we won't have any discussion about them at all, because when we do the practice day, we'll go over that again. So we'll have a, there'll be a full, a full presentation of everything. So let's dedicate the uh, energy that we've created, the virtuous karma. If we've had moments tonight when we've had some kind of uh, mini epiphany, thinking, "Oh, I don't, I don't have to be angry. It's all these bad things are my guru," you know, or some virtuous karma that we've created due to the force of our motivation, we've created roots of virtue this evening for sure. 
even if we reminded ourselves that doubt, even doubt in emptiness can shake the roots of samsara. Rejoicing about that for an instant, even when you think about those roots of virtue, creates more virtue. Dedicate this so that it is not exhausted in just some samsaric episode of happiness in the future, but becomes, we dedicate it to that long goal in the future, our own enlightenment, in that state in which having all knowledge, all compassion, all of our problems overcome, we'll be able to effortlessly know what is best for sentient beings. We'll be of no harm to them, we'll effortlessly be able to affect their welfare, bring happiness, guide them out of samsara. So for that reason, think, may these merits actually ripen in such a way that it brings that about. May they become contributing causes, may they I dedicate these merits to that goal, my own enlightenment for the welfare of sentient beings. To become a better person, less harmful, less needy, more loving. And then preserve that in the emptiness of the three spheres, dedicate in the emptiness of the three spheres, to seal that the merits themselves are empty, merely labeled, have no inherent existence as they appear to our minds, nor does the goal, our own enlightenment for the welfare of sentient beings, effortlessly affecting their welfare, nor does the dedication have any inherent existence, although right now as we're meditating, thinking I am dedicating, without Without checking, it seems like there is an inherently existent act of dedication. That too is merely labeled. So letting go of those, rededicating within the emptiness of the three spheres, seals the karma so the collection of wisdom is also created so this karma cannot even be destroyed by anger. almost like making it insubstantial, the virtuous karma that we created, so that even the fires of anger lo no longer can destroy them. Conventional dedication, mainly affecting the, preventing the karma from being exhausted in ripening in the future. Only, they'll only be exhausted in enlightenment if they're not destroyed first. But sealing it in the emptiness of the three spheres prevents them from even being destroyed by anger, wrong view, so forth, abandoning the Dharma and so forth.